the bitch is back. In a world overflowing with movies, we need a hero. Someone to separate the bad from the good. Hi everyone, I'm Em and welcome to Verbal Diorama episode 115, Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection. This is the podcast that's all about the history and legacy of movies you know and movies you don't. And just to start off, a huge hi and welcome to you all. Whether you are a returning listener, whether you're a brand new listener to this podcast, whether you literally just started with Alien and Aliens and now you want to know about Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection and you want to complete the Verbal Diorama Alien Quadrilogy... No matter how you're here, I'm so grateful that you are here. And this is a bit of a different episode. It's something that I wanted to try, basically. So I'm calling this episode a a Nanorama. And that does not mean it's anything to do with nans, by the way, uh, which is obviously a very British colloquial term for a grandmother. But basically, uh, a Nanorama, the way that I'm thinking of it, is going to be a slightly shorter episode. I want to focus on tidbits of interesting stories and information from movies that honestly are never going to get a full episode dedicated to them for whatever reason, but who still deserve a mention. So I kind of feel like this is the honourable mentions section of Verbal Diorama. And I wanted to start with the Alien sequels. And the reason I wanted to start with the Alien sequels, and by that I mean Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection, of course, is that I've covered Alien and I've covered Aliens. So Alien is episode 108, Aliens is episode 114. And then when it came to the Alien sequels, there's some really interesting information about those sequels. And arguably, overall, they aren't as good as their predecessors, but they do have some really interesting behind the scenes stories. So today, in this slightly different format of an episode, we're going to be starting with Alien 3. Was there an alien on board? Yes. There's definitely something in here with us. We have no weapons of any kind. Start. It's here! After her last encounter, Ellen Ripley crash lands on Fiorina 161, a maximum security prison. When a series of strange and deadly events occur shortly after her arrival, Ripley realises that she has brought along an unwelcome visitor. Go through the cast of this movie, we have Sigourney Weaver returning as Ellen Ripley, Charles S. Dutton as Leonard Dillon, Charles Dance as Jonathan Clemens, Brian Glover as Harold Andrews, Ralph Brown as Francis Aaron, Paul McGann as Walter Golick, Danny Webb as Robert Morse, Lance Henriksen as the voice of Bishop, Tom Woodruff Jr. as the quadrupedal alien, Pete Postlethwaite as David Postlethwaite, and Lance Henriksen again as Michael Bishop. The story was by Vincent Ward, the screenplay by David Guiler, Walter Hill and Larry Ferguson. It was directed by David Fincher and it was based on characters by Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Shusett. And Alien 3 is mostly known for being the alien movie that killed off fan favourites Hicks and Newt from Aliens immediately. But it started out as something totally different to what we ended up with. In fact, multiple different beings. After the success of Aliens, 20th Century Fox were keen to keep the Aliens train chugging along. But Brandywine Productions didn't want to do a copy-paste job 
on what had come before in Alien and Aliens. They were, however, keen to get Ridley Scott to return to direct a story based on a treatment by David Guiler, Walter Hill and Gordon Carroll about why Wayland yutani was so keen to use the aliens as biological weapons. That obviously never materialised, so let's go through all of the iterations of Alien 3. In September 1987, David Guiler and Walter Hill approached author William Gibson, who is widely credited with pioneering the science fiction subgenre cyberpunk after his critically acclaimed debut novel Neuromancer and its sequels. Gibson was asked to deliver a script by that December. The script, set straight after the events in Aliens and to be directed by Rennie Harlan, had Ripley put in a coma after Hicks, who is promoted to main protagonist in this version, discovers the Wayland yutani Corporation is creating an alien army and all humans need to band together to fight genetically altered xenomorphs that can reproduce by a close proximity airborne contagion that have overrun an enormous space mall named Anchor Point. Humans inhaling the contagion would turn into xenomorphs, a concept quite similar to John Carpenter's The Thing, in that no one would know who was infected by the airborne contagion. Gibson's second draft in 1988 scaled back the number of xenomorph antagonists to three and toned down the action, making it more alien than aliens. Michael Bean was delighted at his expanded role and Sigourney Weaver agreed to a glorified cameo. The idea being that Ripley would survive and she and Hicks would team up for the sequel, which would take place on the alien's homeworld. Uh, and just to add as well, Newt also survives in this version and ends up living with her grandparents on Earth. The producers were unsatisfied with both scripts, although it has since become a fan favourite. This particular screenplay was made into a comic book series called Alien 3, the unproduced screenplay by Dark Horse Comics in 2018, and it was adapted as an audiobook drama for the Aliens 40th anniversary celebrations in 2019, starring Michael Bean and Lance Henriksen, which is available on Audible if you are interested. Next up, we have the Eric Red script, who was a writer suggested by Rennie Harlan. This script was known as Alien World and focused on a character named Sam Smith, who boards the Sulaco as it drifts in space and finds all three cryotubes holding Ripley, Newt and Hicks smashed and three xenomorph eggs. A xenomorph attacks and he wakes up. It was all a dream, or was it? He's now got a cybernetic arm after an unknown accident and lives on a space station set up like rural farm in middle America with his parents and siblings. He discovers an area labelled Sector C as closely guarded and heavily militarised and no one will tell him what really happened on the Sulaco. He finds out that the military are intentionally impregnating farm animals by facehuggers with the lead scientist Dr Rand claiming to have domesticated the xenomorph before it attacks and kills her. With all the animals infected, the town flees before 20 human-animal-xenomorph hybrids fuse together to make a giant xenomorph which eats the fleeing ship. I'm not making this up. Eric Red would go on to disown his script, claiming it wasn't actually his script, that it was the product of too many story conferences and interference. Brandywine would reject this script with deviating too much from their original story. Unlike William Gibson and Eric Red's scripts, David Toohey's 1989 script bears a small resemblance to the Alien 3 we ended up with, due to it being set on a giant prison ship slash ore refinery. Like the other two scripts, Ripley was nowhere to be found, with a new protagonist, Styles, arriving at the prison and put to work in the foundry, along with new inmates. Unbeknownst to him, three years earlier, a facehugger had been found encased in amber among some space debris. Styles is awoken one night to scratching from beneath his cell and the following day a fellow prisoner is set to be executed in the gas chamber but instead of being killed he's rendered unconscious and awakes later in a small chamber where a xenomorph breaks in and rips him apart. The creature rampages through the cell block killing its occupants but by the time the prison guards arrive the xenomorph is gone and Styles is the only witness and survivor. It turns out the prison is growing xenomorphs in a lab and using them to execute prisoners, several examples of which are grotesquely deformed. Rennie Harlan, at this point tired of the development hell Alien 3 was perpetually in, left the project after a year stewing on it after reading David Toohey's first draft. When it was sent to Fox, President Joe Roth didn't like the idea of having an Alien movie without Ripley. Sigourney Weaver, who had no intention to return to the series, was offered $5 million dollars plus a share of the box office to return, to which she agreed as long as the script was impressive, original and not dependent on guns. David Toohey reportedly rewrote this script to include Ripley, but his script was ultimately rejected and Vincent Ward and John Fasano were the fourth and fifth writers on the project. 
But we'll start with Vincent Ward because he was the guy who ultimately got a story by credit on the final movie. Vincent Ward, who was also set to direct, set his version of Alien 3 on the wooden planet Archeon, where a collection of monks live. Ripley's escape pod crashes on this monastery. The monks had seen the pod and called it a star in the east, believing it to be a good omen. Obviously, having a woman in a monastery means the monks decide on a religious trial to avoid sexual temptation and believe they are being punished by a creature for their sins. They lock Ripley away and disregard her knowledge of what this potential creature could be. The monks believing the creature is the devil. The story being Vincent Ward's and the screenplay being written by John Fasano. The deaths of Hicks and Newt would ultimately come from this script, as would the idea of a Luddite prison filled with male inmates, as opposed to a Luddite monastery filled with monks. Ripley's jump into a furnace also comes from here, and Sigourney Weaver wanted to ensure Ripley's death, in her words, because she'd killed these aliens twice and didn't want to have to keep doing it. The dog alien also stems from this version. Basically, a lot of what we see in Alien 3 actually comes from this script. The idea of an almost archaic wooden planet with its wooden platforms, pulleys and other low-tech visuals that would naturally all have to be practical effects impressed those who knew about it. Times journalist David Hughes suggested Ward's version of Alien 3 as one of the greatest sci-fi movies never made in his book of the same name and Empire magazine describing the idea as undeniably attractive and could have made for some astonishing action sequences. But Brandywine producers only saw logistical issues and questioned how a wooden planet in space would be created and maintained. Because Vincent Ward was the first writer to work with eventual director David Fincher on the story, John Fasano, who'd arguably done more work, was denied a credit on the finished movie. Fasano would quit when Larry Ferguson, a script doctor, came on board for rewrites. And so we essentially finish on the Walter Hill and David Guiler script, which was used for the finished movie. However, it was still undergoing changes after filming started. Alien 3 has a very well-known and incredibly troubled production. Director David Fincher was only 27 at the time, and this was his feature directorial debut. He was subject to incessant studio meddling and eventually walked out of the production altogether. Subsequently, the studio reworked the film into the eventual theatrical cut without Fincher's approval. David Fincher has publicly disowned the movie completely. However, the release of the assembly cut in 2003 for the Alien Quadrilogy box set is more in line with Fincher's original vision, adding 30 minutes of additional footage. The released assembly cut wasn't overseen by Fincher. It was instead supervised by Charles de Lurizica, who directed many Alien documentaries and produced the Alien Quadrilogy box set. He actually found an early lost cut in storage at 20th Century Fox, which had been assembled by Fincher, hence assembly cut. Unlike the other alternate cuts of the Alien movies, it's the only one to not include an introduction from its original director. But according to sources online, David Fincher has given the project his blessing. The assembly cut is widely seen by most to be a better movie overall, and while it wasn't a complete financial or critical disaster, it certainly wasn't as well received as its two predecessors. And so that is a truncated version of the story behind the stories on Alien 3. But now I want to fast forward a few years to talk about Alien Resurrection. These were very, very hard to come by. So was our cargo. Whatever you got going on here ain't exactly approved by Congress. It's a military operation. Really? Who are you? Ripley Ellen, Lieutenant First Class, number 36706. Ellen Ripley died 200 years ago. You're a thing, a construct. They grew you in a lab. What the hell is going on here? He is breeding an alien species. I wish you could understand what we're trying to do here. Now they brought it out of you. Not all the way out. You want to tell us what this is? It's a queen. She'll breed. You'll die. Ellen Ripley died trying to wipe the species out. I'm not anxious to see her taking up her old hobby. I can feel it. I can hear it moving. 
So he, like, ran into these things before. Yeah. What did you do? I died. We're moving. That's a standard emergency procedure. Any serious problem in the ship autopilots back to home base. What's home base? Earth. After her death, Ellen Ripley is revived as a powerful human-alien hybrid clone. Along with a crew of space pirates, she must again battle the deadly aliens and stop them from reaching Earth. We'll quickly go through the cast. Again, Sigourney Weaver, this time as Ripley 8. Winona Ryder as Anna Lee Call. Dominique Pignon as Dom Vries. Ron Perlman as Ron Jonah. Gary Dorden as Gary Christie. Michael Wincott as Frank Elgin. Kim Flowers as Sabra Hillard, Dan Hedaya as General Martin Perez, J.E. Freeman as Dr. Mason Wren, Brad Dorif as Dr. Jonathan Gediman, and Raymond Cruz as Vincent Di Stefano. This movie was written by Joss Whedon, it was directed by Jean-Pierre Jeannot, and it was based on characters by Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Shusett. So, while Alien 3 underperformed at the US box office, bringing in only $55.5 million domestically, it grossed a further $104 million internationally, making it the second highest earning film in the Alien franchise. Fox, however, stated it was the highest grossing with $175 million, but I've spoken about their creative accountancy issues in previous episodes. Now, the Alien trilogy, as it was then known, had finished with the death of both Ripley and the Alien Queen embryo inside her, and most thought that the ending, plus the diminishing returns of the franchise, meant that Alien 4 wouldn't happen. Fox, on the other hand, realised the potential value of their IP, and several years after the release of Alien 3, rumblings started occurring about how they could invigorate the franchise with a new entry, and this started in 1995 by Fox executive George Saralegu. 20th Century Fox had been impressed by Joss Whedon, who's super problematic, but we're not going to dwell on that right now. This was obviously pre-Buffy Whedon, but post-Buffy the movie Whedon, because lest we forget, Buffy the Vampire Slayer started life as a movie in 1992. Whedon was also a well-known script doctor, working uncredited on movies like Speed, Waterworld and Twister, and credited on Toy Story and Titan AE, both former episodes of this podcast, that's episode 50, and episode number one as well, Speed is episode eight. He would write Alien Resurrection during his script doctor days, and he composed a 30-page treatment for his idea for Alien 4, which didn't include Ripley because Ellen Ripley had thrown herself into a furnace at the end of Alien 3. His initial script had a third act set on Earth. He would write five versions of this final act, none of which would end up in the finished movie. Originally, 20th Century Fox toyed with bringing back the character of Newt in a lower-budget spin-off, focusing on a clone of the character. It was David Guiler and Walter Hill who came up with the idea of cloning a previously deceased character for Alien 4. And this was where Newt came in, and the resurrection part of the name making sense. But why resurrect Newt when you can resurrect Ripley? Because Ripley was the cornerstone of the franchise. Whedon was asked to rewrite his script to bring back Ripley, although Whedon felt the experience of rewriting to add Ripley was difficult. Once this script was presented to Sigourney Weaver, who famously wanted Ripley to die in Alien 3 so as not to make a mockery of the character, she was actually impressed with the concept. She liked the idea of Ripley being a part human, part alien clone. Getting Sigourney Weaver back on board, though, meant the biggest payday for the actress so far. $11 million plus a co-producer credit. Sigourney Weaver originally had no intention to come back as Ripley, but changed her mind when they, and I quote, basically drove a dump truck full of money to my house. But the idea being that Alien 4 would have a clone of Ripley and would essentially end with an alien on its way to Earth, with the proposed Alien 5 being set on Earth. When it came to finding a director, it was pretty clear cut that David Fincher would not be returning due to his many troubles on the previous movie, but the first person up for the job would be Danny Boyle. Obviously at that time, fresh off more indie fare like Shallow Grave and Trainspotting, 
And before he'd take on sci-fi himself with the excellent and very underappreciated Sunshine, he was a huge Alien fan and was sent the script for the fourth movie. He liked the idea of cloning, he was a fan of Joss Whedon, and really thought the project was right up his street. He agreed to direct and pre-production started on Alien Resurrection with Sigourney Weaver leading the cast and Winona Ryder also on board. Danny Boyle, though, started to get cold feet when he realised an Alien movie would be big on effects and puppetry and he didn't feel like he had the experience necessary. Additionally, he was offered to direct a fantastic and also pretty underrated movie called A Life Less Ordinary, which he felt way more comfortable with and so Danny Boyle ended up leaving the project. Other directors in the mix included a pre-Lord of the Rings Peter Jackson and a pre-X-Men Brian Singer, as well as Paul W.S. Anderson, who'd eventually go on to direct Alien vs. Predator. But it was French director Jean-Pierre Junot who was approached for his unique visual style. Junot was about to start production on Amelie, but postponed it to take Alien Resurrection, his first attempt at a Hollywood production, with a budget of $70 million, the highest in the franchise so far. This also included a translator because Junot spoke very little English at the time. He would hire French special effects supervisor Pitoff and cinematographer Darius Congi, both of whom he worked with on The City of Lost Children. Unlike David Finch's experience on Alien 3, Jean-Pierre Junot was given complete creative control over Alien Resurrection, an unprecedented move by Fox. He wanted to bring back H.R. Geiger for the creature designs, but eventually Amalgamated Dynamics, who'd also worked on Alien 3, came back on board. Unlike the previous three Alien films, which were all shot here in the UK, Alien Resurrection was filmed in Los Angeles, mostly at the behest of Sigourney Weaver, who didn't want to travel, with the first scenes to be shot, the famous underwater scenes, which were shot at stage 16 at Fox Studios, in a 36 by 45 metre tank, 4.5 metres deep, containing 548,000 gallons of water. Although everyone hired on the cast needed to know how to swim as a prerequisite, the underwater scenes were particularly difficult and anxiety-inducing for Winona Ryder, who had almost drowned aged 12. Finding studio space turned out to be tough, as most of Hollywood's available studios were taken up with the filming of Titanic, The Lost World Jurassic Park and Starship Troopers. And while you could argue that a clone wouldn't have the memories of the original being, that's a topic for a science podcast probably, Ripley 8, as the character was now called, the eighth and only successful clone of Ellen Ripley, would seemingly have special powers and abilities, the most famous of which was getting a basketball through a hoop while facing the opposite direction. Now, there are a lot of places on the internet that say she got this on the first try, which technically isn't correct. We have trained with basketball coach Nigel Miguel and her conversion rate was one in six. Her goal was actually increased to six feet past the three-point line for filming, and when it came, Jean-Pierre Genet suggested they drop the ball from above to make it look like she'd achieved the shot, but Weaver refused. She took the first shot and missed. She missed the second shot too. She had a couple more off-camera tries before setting up a third shot. She walked to her mark, tossed the ball behind her, and got it. The miracle shot was almost, almost ruined by co-star Ron Perlman, who'd spent most of the shoot playing ball with Weaver who sees the shot go in, erupts into a huge grin and shouts a swear word into the camera. Worried the shot was unusable, it was examined and clever editing was used to avoid Perlman breaking character. Amalgamated Dynamics, who I've spoken about this podcast many times, but mostly for their work on Tremors and the unused creature work for the sequel slash reboot of The Thing, worked on both Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection, as well as animation studio Blue Sky Studios, who'd famously go on to make the Ice Age movies, They were in charge of the CGI aliens in Alien Resurrection. The newborn alien was a full-sized animatronic and was designed to look more human than alien, with features similar to Sigourney Weaver's bone structure, but not too similar as they didn't want to copy the design for Syl from Species. The hybrid was also designed and made to have both visible male and female genitalia, but the studio balked at this, and so the genitalia was digitally removed during post-production. I just want to finish this slightly smaller episode with some of my thoughts on these movies because for all of their misgivings and issues, both of these movies have greatness in them. And that's probably the most frustrating thing about both of them. I'm actually yet to see The Assembly Cut of Alien 3 and I will, I promise, it's on my to-do list. But the concept of a prison ship and the idea of Ripley, yet again, being the smart lady no one listens to, arguably to the image of a shaven-headed Ripley cowering and terrified next to an alien is one of the most striking images of the whole franchise. And yet it doesn't come from Alien, it doesn't come from Aliens, it comes from Alien 3. And I think a lot of people forget that. 
And then Alien Resurrection, arguably the weakest of the four movies, and yet contains some striking imagery too. The failed clones, the basketball scene. I remember the visuals of Resurrection more than Alien 3. Although Ripley diving into a furnace should have been the end for the character, Ripley going out on her own volition. Ripley 8 never feels like Ripley, which is both a blessing and a curse. It's great that Sigourney Weaver gets to explore a new characterization, but as a viewer, it's hard to separate this character from the actual Ripley. Ripley was one of my heroes, and Ripley 8 positions her as neither a hero nor a villain. Her intentions to the audience are known, her bond with the newborn alien, an interesting concept, but something that the movie ultimately fails to really deliver on. And basically, we end up with two movies that everyone remains really proud of in Alien and Aliens, and two movies that their contributors are somewhat disowned. David Fincher with Alien 3 and Joss Whedon with Alien Resurrection. Alien 5 was mooted. Joss Whedon had written an Earth-set script, but Weaver wasn't interested. Before Alien vs Predator was greenlit, James Cameron had expressed an interest in returning to the franchise for a fifth movie. Now he's knee-deep in Avatar movies. And now Disney has acquired Fox. It has confirmed future Alien films are in development, but no further information about those as of yet. Instead, we got Prometheus and Alien Covenant, prequels to the series, both of which from Ridley Scott, as well as Alien vs Predator and Alien vs Predator Requiem spin-offs. But maybe I'll save those for another NaNoWriMo episode in the future. But for now, thank you for listening. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts on Alien 3 and or Alien Resurrection. And I'd also like to hear your thoughts about this new NaNoWriMo format. Do you like the smaller bite-sized episodes on movies that the main episodes probably won't cover? Hopefully you do, because I would like to do some more. And I think I'm going to do, definitely going to do Prometheus and Alien Covenant, and also Alien vs Predator and Alien vs Predator Requiem, because I kind of feel like those movies are pretty perfect for this particular format. But for now... If you wish to listen to the previous Alien episodes, as I say, they are episodes 108, which is Alien, and 114, which is Aliens. If you want to speak to me about these movies, you can do so. I am at Verbal Diorama on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. You can also contact me, verbaldiorama at gmail.com. As always, a huge thank you to the patrons of this podcast. If you wish to join them, it's verbaldiorama.com slash Patreon. And finally, there's a monster in your chest. These guys hijacked your ship and they sold your cryo tube to this human, and he put an alien inside of you. It's a really nasty one, and in a few hours, it's going to burst through your ribcage, and you're going to die. Any questions? Bye.